all about cylinders and we're talking to the mechanics in the hangar. I used to be a well-respected member of the aviation community and then I started flying a Cirrus and that changed. <laughs> oh, that was great until the engine quit. And all of a sudden I see these explosions and these trees exploding. I'm walking away a better pilot because of this discussion. Hello and welcome to this edition of In The Hangar. We're talking all about overhauls. I've got a great group of guys here to, uh, to discuss that. Let's uh, introduce them real quick. John? Okay, John Effinger, and I'm a mechanic, a and IA, uh, private pilot, and basically work on Cessna aircraft. This is where I primarily work my focus. Bill? Uh, Bill Gilbel, same thing, uh, very similar. Kind of do part-time, but um, a and IA, pilot, owner, um, and I work on pretty much uh, ver various aircraft, numerous models. Hey, Bill Ross, Superior Air Parts. I'm the Vice President of Product Support. I'm an AMP, IA, uh, commercial pilot and aircraft owner. And I'm Scott Hayes, uh, Superior Air Parts. I'm the sales and marketing guy. I'm a pilot and we both fly. All right, so we've got a lot of, a lot of good aviation uh, AMP kind of experience here. So let's just start off right off the bat. You know, when, I'm, uh, when I was looking to buy my plane, I would see, you know, uh, time since overhaul or time since remanufactured or fac factory or I, what are the different types of <laughs> overhauls? Okay, so we were talking about this a little bit earlier. So you've got essentially an overhaul per a field overhaul, but it's an overhaul with the uh, manufacturer's data uh, overhaul manual. So an AMP mechanic, uh, there are certain engines that are limited, but an AMP mechanic can uh, overhaul an engine in the field, so to speak, at their shop. So that, that's an overhaul. Time continues. Mm -hmm. Time continues. Yeah, and the time continues. So you, if you had 2,000 hours when you, when you took the engine off to overhaul, when you got done, you would be zero since overhaul, but 2,000 hours total time. So the time oh, would continue. Oh, okay. Okay, but again, when you refreshed everything, everything's up to, okay. to service limits. It's service limits. Uh, another option would be to rebuild or remanufacture. I don't know what the proper verbiage is. Um, mm -hmm. Rebuild. rebuild. Um, where you send the engine back to the manufacturer and they will they will use serviceable parts uh, Then the other option as a, as a buyer your other option is brand new engine So that's pretty much it as far as total overhaul. Those are the three. Okay. Well, then what was my, I had to do a top overhaul That's not a type of overhaul. That's and I'll let John talk about that Well, you know, we discussed it at the time but your top overhaul was basically we refreshed your cylinders and pistons we could have done it several ways. We looked at several options. It depends upon the amount of hours on your cylinders, what kind of cylinders you had, what the condition was. In your case, we went with new cylinders. So, and it was superior, and that was the best deal and the best bang for the buck in your case. Well, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, but so, so in the different types of overhauls, when I'm seeing a plane for sale, or if I try to sell my plane, am I, I you know, am I allowed to say, you know, 20 hours since top overhaul? Um, yeah, or, sure. Yeah, okay, sure. So, absolutely. Because yeah. you're just saying that you had the cylinders in the top end redone at a certain time period. And, uh, you know, with an overhauled engine or a rebuilt, whatever your engine time is, that's going to stay the same. But the cylinders, that's a big issue. Generally, anywhere from 500 hours to 800 hours on a lot of the Continental motors, you'll see a top overhaul. Oh, that's soon. Okay, because we were at uh, 1,100, I think, or uh, just over 1,000 for mine when we did the top. Right. Of course, that was an AD you were lucky. mandated. You were <laughs> lucky. And it also depends on the, on the use. If you fly your engine 20 hours a, a year, you may right. you may end up changing a cylinder every other year. If you fly your your engine 1,000 hours a year, you may go because you're, you're keeping it lubricated. There's no corrosion. You're keeping it active and all that. So you're going to see different different utility well works. that was a big eye-opener for me because and I mentioned it in another video is that uh, when when John you know I was afraid you know I told him yeah I we flew it 250 hours and I thought I was gonna get my butt kicked <laughs> by the mechanic because that's so much flying on the thing and he was like oh great you know he liked it. <laughs> and I didn't get that as a new uh, pilot yeah. and new owner you know w what was going on there so um, it, now I know um, that you know the corrosive uh, all the stuff that's going on in there is just sitting there eating away. And if you can keep that, those parts moving, sure. they actually last longer. Right. Yeah. yeah, and that's where I kind of base my first response on that with the 500, 800. If you're flying 100 hours a year, 
Continental engines, you'll see a pretty close average to that. If you're flying 150 hours a year, you could add considerable time to that. Yeah, it's just so backwards it, it to me. It just depends <laughs> upon your type of operation in your environment where are you operating. Right. Yeah, if you're in Florida in the salt air versus yeah. uh, up in the north, up in, in the up cold in the north. starts, you're not preheating. Those yeah. guys could probably talk well, about and, that and quite a bit. Yeah. Bill and I were looking through the most recent trade of plane, just flipping through it, and we, we found a 63 model 172 that had just under a thousand hours total time since new. So what do you think the inside of that engine looks like yeah. from a Holy corrosion cow. standpoint? Yeah. So, and the average owner looks at that like, well, the engine... Oh, it's only got 170... Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's far from the truth. A corrosive attack is very detrimental, too. But if, if that was in Arizona, based in the middle of Arizona, I've found those as well. Yeah. And the engine's fine. fine. Everything else is rotten on the yeah. airplane. Exactly. The engine's <laughs> great. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. But we have to factor the calendar time in and... The, and if the uh, engine's been sedentary, if, it, if, it's, if the aircraft's not been flown, all those things have to be factored when making a purchase. Yeah, we've, we've got an aircraft right in right now. I've got one in it 20, hour, 20 years since overhaul, 400 hours. 400 hours since major, 20 years. And we're pulling cylinders off at 400 hours because of Oh, wow, it, because they just never fly it. They never fly it, and we're having valve issues and things of that nature. Shouldn't have it. Shouldn't ever okay. have it. I we, mean, we're, we're three, 400 hours short of where we should be. Well, just to clarify for those people like me who may not understand real quick in a nutshell what what is why why do you do engines last longer when you fly them more uh, think about it this way if you take a shovel okay in your backyard and you go dig a hole okay and it's all shiny right and then you sit in your backyard for two weeks what's going to happen to that nice shiny it's going to rust there you go. What's going to happen to the what's going to happen to the cylinders on the valve faces you've got not only do you have moisture uh, cam, especially in Lycomings with the top cam, you have that kind of stuff. And in addition to that, we have fuel products. We have fuel byproducts, which are corrosive. So now you have this, I call it a terrarium, inside the engine. And all it wants to do is it wants to decompose the engine. But if you continually are flushing it with washing that oil, uh, washing all those parts with oil, keeping that, heating it, mo getting that moisture out, it's going to last longer. Okay, good. All right, so now let's go back to the, my situation with the top overhaul. I have a Cessna 210 Centurion. Uh, you took the engine apart. Well, I, actually, first you said, what do you want to do? And uh, walk through what kind of choices you gave me. Well, on your cylinders, we weren't able to overhaul yours. That would have been probably the most economical okay. solution. Right, because the AD says, thou shalt lose the cylinders. And, and, and when you look at the variables here, uh, you know, we did another engine not long ago. Some cylinders were chrome, some were steel. They had various times on them. Um, most of them were overhauled at least twice. So when you're looking at that, then you're going to want to go with new. Uh, it's almost the most feasible way to look at it. The factory new, there's some kind of benefits to go factory new. We got superior air parts. There's a whole lot more financial incentive to go that route. And they're fairly comparable nowadays. Uh, you have to look at the history. You have to look at what type of plating you want on the cylinders. There's all kinds of variables we Well, I remember you, you we told me, at. you said you can go, with, uh, you can go nickel. with nickel plating if you wanted, Dan. <clears throat> and and I, not knowing anything, well, what's the difference? Well, we, the, and that's actually back to we, the shovel. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what you told me. You right, said, right. well, Dan, how many hours have you flown? And that's what we got. Well, I've, I've flown 250. Oh, then you don't need nickel. So what does that mean? Well, that meant some cost savings. <laughs> right. Okay, so then you, you, you made some calls to find out uh, what my options were. And right. what did you find in the calls? Well, we opted with the superior cylinders. It was the best bang for the buck. They were steel cylinders. Um, you, there was no reason not to use steel on your engine. And it was just basically economics and looking at the uh, different cylinders out there. Continental's been changing processes. Do we want to go back to the same scenario where we got to change the cylinder prematurely because they changed your process and now they say that the cylinders are no good? Right. Well, and, and for me, I remember quite clearly, given the choices, you looked at it and a uh, new Continental um, was going to cost this much. Um, new Superior would cost this much. And I think like reman, remanufactured or whatever 
Continental overhaul, overhauled engine uh, cylinders were still coming in. I can't remember they, if they, they were, were cheaper. They cheaper. Were, that would be the cheapest route to go. Right. But we and know I remember we, going, I, I felt better there. about new, and I made a decision to go with Superior. So um, six new Superior cylinders have now been put in the deal. I'd like to make a comment about an overhaul cylinder because that term is used loosely within our industry. Um, uh, it may just actually be a repaired cylinder. I've, I've seen that yep. a lot. And by letter of the law, if you really look at the overhaul procedure for was, a cylinder, yeah. you really, in order to do the, the non-destructive testing correctly, the magnetic particle inspection of the barrel, you really need to debarrel the cylinder so that you do a shot, a magnetism shot this way and longitudinally. Most people that are overhauling cylinders are not, or are claiming to overhaul cylinders are not doing that. So it's really a repaired cylinder in a lot of cases that the consumer is actually getting, not a, not a complete overhaul when they go that route. Well, okay. Uh, some of this, you know, of course, is over my head. When you say repaired versus overhauled, what are we talking about that's being done here? Well, it depends. A lot of, a lot of times it's done on condition when, when you have uh, an event where you, let's say, you have low compression. Sometimes it may be um, just reworking the, the valve. If it's, a, if it's an exhaust valve that's leaking, that's all they'll do. They'll touch home the cylinder with a, uh, you know, put a scratch in the cylinder re to retain oil, put new rings in, and that's it. The cylinder does not go through a full gamut of non-destructive testing of the head and the barrel to look for cracks and, and things like that. And well, all the fits and limits limits throughout the cylinder sometimes are not checked. They're just, it's just overhauled for that specific condition. And it depends upon who cylinders you use and exactly. who the cylinder shop is. Definitely. You could use a fluorescent wet bath, for mm -hmm. example, and that's what pretty common sure. in yeah. the big yeah. cylinder yeah. overhaul shops. Right. So they do a sufficient job with the wet bath. Um, there's mandatory requirements, and I'm not sure about light combing so much, but Continental, uh, you've got to replace the exhaust valves. So and if you're working on a light combing yeah. engine and you're working on a Continental cylinder, there are going to be little variances exactly. in there. Yeah. So a quality overhaul with a quality cylinder shop, they've got most of the equipment to do a pretty, right. pretty yeah. good job on it. And again, it, it's, it's economics. Okay. And it, well, it's, and it's, and to your point, it's going to it depend on what you start with, okay? So uh, I think in your situation, you had to throw your cylinders away. There was an air this directive, so boom, that you had no choice. So you had to go away. Um, I've had engines come in where when I do the business case of should I get them the old ones restored, uh, refurbished, or just buy new, it's a chip shot. So why mess with an overhauled cylinder when I can just get a new one for a couple hundred bucks more? Not a problem. Now, why would I do that? Okay, now, and just to kind of go through what's going to happen when a cylinder gets overhauled. They're going to they're going to check the bore, make sure that's all good and, and well. Uh, if it's not right, they may, it may be bored oversized. They're going to make sure that the service finish is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, just kind of like that. Um, this, the valve, the valves, uh, the exhaust valves typically are replaced. It's that's where all the heat's happening, all the bad metallurgical things. Guides typically are replaced. Make sure they're they're back to the proper inner diameter. Some, on some of the engines, the rocker bushings will be replaced or uh, actually installed, depending on the vintage of them. The uh, cylinder, uh, the spark plug uh, hole. And one of the things that actually is really horrific on these is the uh, exhaust ports. Typically, you'll have nothing but corrosion products coming out of there, and you'll have a need, it'll need to be refaced. New studs get corroded and all that. There's just lots of bad stuff happening. After a couple of cycles of, we'll call it service, overhaul, whatever, there's so much entrained debris metallurgically that these cylinders really can't re weld repair anymore. So you just throw them out. You, they just can't be repaired. In today's world with better alloys, newer alloys and all that, it's, it's, it's a whole lot better. But uh, I had an engine that, um, again, we just went with new cylinders. I had another engine, first run factory engine, uh, factory Lycoming cylinders. They were fine. And they, they typically I can do two overhaul cycles and then after that, it's, then you really have to put the critical eye and say, do we throw it away right. or do we actually go with new yeah. to get two more overhaul cycles? So you got to kind of look at a business case, kind of a life cycle cost, which way is the best. The other thing, too, is if I'm running a flight school, I don't have to be chasing used cylinder issues. I, it might be prudent just to go with, with new stuff, and then that way I know it's out making money. 
for its service life. However long, whether it's 500 hours, 700 hours, 1,200, whatever, I don't want to deal with cylinders. I want that thing out making money. I'll just add a little bit to that too. When you talk about overhaul cylinders, you'll go to the big, the big shops that send out lots of cylinders. They all got yellow tags, they're all overhauled, and that's all they're advertised as. You have no idea what the service hi history was yeah. on those cylinders. Right. That could have been a 2,000 hour wore out engine. It could have been a 300 hour cylinder that needed a repair. So you got to look at repair, overhaul, and all the all the yeah, considerations I mean, we've been talking about. Well, now. when I went when I went through the decision making process, yeah, do I want to buy somebody else's unknown mystery nightmare or yep. just go with new? So yeah, and, uh, and I'd also like to add that you don't know the history of the thermal cycling, how that owner operated and the, and that, that might have been why they failed. Things like yeah. that could, could be. Okay. So, so we're kind of crossing up here. We're going, what's an overhaul? Right. What's a repair and everything? Right. right. Yet every situation varies on this, and you can only make the best decision and judgment based on what you're looking at. If you had thermal cycles and you over your cylinders, it might have 200, 300 hours on it. It had an intake leak. That cylinder versus one that had 600 hours, you had a ring finish problem. The airplane sat for a long time. There was corrosion and the rings are going bad, or, or they're running them different operating right. techniques. we we'll get into the Lena Peak, Richard Peak debate. Right, right. That which, causes which cylinder we're issues, We're gonna possibly. save that for an another episode, too. But, <laughs> Good, uh, we could be here a while. As, yeah, as a pilot and not as a uh, AMP, um, you know, this is where I have to write that big check and, and, and you, I make the decision on new or, 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 or factory overhaul, whatever. Yeah. Sure. Then let's real quick hit the one thing that uh, happened after the overhaul, and that is breaking the engine in and what's happening. So I didn't quite get it um, when we first started the process, and it wasn't until recently I saw a post on Facebook where they broke down the cylinder, and 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 you know microscopically you've got all these edges, and I didn't understand why you had me going full, you know, that you had me going full on high RPM early on, don't idle, you know, be running that engine hard right at the beginning. Cause that just, again, as a pilot um, who knows nothing, that really confused me. So what's happening? Well, the, the biggest thing you're doing is you, you, you've got these fresh metal finished parts, they're all machined. And now you have an oil, you have an oil film and you're basic, I call it metallurgical trauma. You're basically grinding these parts together. Um, they don't want to be together, they weren't made together, but you're forcing them to lap in to meet each other's contour. And so, as a result, when you have friction, or too much friction, you're going to have heat. If you have a lot of heat, you know you're going to have a lot of heat, keep a lot of air on it. Don't try to baby. You want to, so, so again, when you look at your braking procedure, and I- Oh, that's I, why you don't need to idle. You need to be flying so that it has full power, a lot of right. air. And when you look at, I, well, I use- Pressure the, <clears throat> on pressure. the rings. Yeah. The, the, I, ring, the ring expansion is what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at a piston ring uh, in these engines, they have what we call a semi-keystone design. So they have a little pitch to them. The, uh, the pressure in the cylinder, the combustion pressure, actually helps uh, that pitch actually squeezes that ring against the cylinder wall very tightly. So we really want a lot of manifold pressure, um, you know, moderate RPM. We want 75% power to best power or richer mixture. We really don't want to run lean a peak and have low cylinder pressures while we're trying to break cylinders in. Once we get past about the two hour mark, the oil consumption should stabilize and the, and the cylinder is, is broken in. Our recommendation is to continue with mineral oil for 25 hours um, and, then, uh, and then you're good to go. We, want, we don't want to be out doing air work and, and slow flight and things like that. We want good, effective pressure in the cylinder, keep those rings squeezed against the, against the cylinder wall so that they will start that incipient wear and wear each other in. Yeah, and, 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 and plated cylinders generally take a, a lot longer to, to break in oh, really? than a non-plated cylinder. Yeah. The good news for me is that I immediately went on some very long cross country so I could just run that thing full on. And that's a good, that's a good thing to do. And okay. that's, a, that's such a good excuse as everybody flying <laughs> can tell you, you know. <laughs> right. There's a reason that you have to run it hard and a reason you gotta throw a lot of fuel at it. So 
there's the enjoyment factor. Yeah. And, and when, you look, <laughs> when you look at the factory break and typical, they're very kind of like Comey, I'll, I'll, uh, they're similar. Now what I typically recommend customers is, okay, you, you have a brand new engine, you have two hours into it, don't go do touch and goes for the next right. 20 hours, okay? Yeah. Go fly somewhere, go on those long, long cross countries. If you're gonna post an aircraft back to the flight line, put it back with the commercial instrument students and go do your long drive flights for the next 10, 20 hours because you may have, depending on what cylinders you have, you want to get your consumption down and you want to keep it cool. You don't want to hurt the engine. And then once once that happens, then if you want to bring it back to your pry fly students to do touch and goes, that's great. But even in a, a 150 or something, post it and just go fly. Don't go sit in the pattern and do heat cycles. Right. And, and I'd like to to add to that, and in the course of 30 odd years in the, in the industry, I've seen a few times where the, the cylinder did not break in. Um, and in, in those instances, the owner babied the engine and uh, mm -hmm. ran high RPM or you know, 2,500, 26, depending on the, on the engine, but babied it from, the, from a manifold pressure point of view. And what that does is allow the piston rings to start to float within the piston lands and we start to get a combustion byproduct around the inside of the ring down past the cylinder and these these hips and valleys that we machined into the cylinder they're there for a purpose and that's to retain oil when they start to get laden with combustion heat you know flame and things like that that starts to form an oil oxide uh, coating it's called glazing you've heard of it's the okay, pilot that's glazed the glazing, his yeah, yeah. Glazing. Glaze it, the pilot glazed his cylinders well what he did was he did not have enough pressure to squeeze those rings and maintain that squeeze and that oil oxide started to crystallize within those hips and valleys now the piston ring is just acting like a squeegee on your car window moving oil back and forth but you don't have any oil retention that will lead to low compression high oil consumption very, very quickly, and accelerated wear of the cylinder because you don't have any oil film that's retained. Remember, there's, there's two, oil does two things. One is lubrication. <laughs> Every week, just think, that's all it's there for. The other thing is to take heat away, because that, that oil will gather the heat from that cylinder and the bottom of that piston, and all that heat, all that combustion, that fire and hell and brimstone that's going on up here, that heat has to go somewhere. It's gonna go at the exhaust pipe, but a lot of it will be retained in the machinery. Yeah. So when you're scraping the oil off, you want oil to be on there, but you want you want oil to be on there that you can scrape off. It's going to bring it back, run it through your cooler so that it cools it down. So you'd never, that's why the, the glazing, we, we, you'll hear folks harp on it. You don't want that to have happen because you're going to lose that ability to have heat rejection through your oil. All right. Well, thanks, guys. That was really good stuff on overhauls. And we'll do another episode on um, some other engine maintenance things. And I really appreciate you guys coming out today to, to be with us and talk. Thanks for having Thanks me. For you, having bet. Us. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so the takeaway here is when you do your overhaul, make sure that you run that engine the way the manufacturers indicate, which is hard usually at the beginning to break that engine in. So thanks for watching. Please share, like, and subscribe if you like what you're seeing. And we'll see you next time in the hangar.